Hello and welcome to another edition of Prosecutors Partners. My name is Dan Satterberg, King County Prosecuting Attorney. And on this show, we meet the people who are making a difference for justice in our community. Today, we're going to set the Wayback Machine for 1969. Probably the most tumultuous period in American history, and Seattle was not immune to the chaos. Today I'm very, very fortunate to have as my guest on Prosecutor Partner, partner former Mayor Wes Ullman. Good morning, Wes. Good morning. Uh, I find your story so amazing, uh, and, I, and I'm so excited to have you help us understand what it was like to live in Seattle in the 60s and to be the mayor of this town, when Richard Nixon was in the White House, when there were protests and bombings and violence in the streets, uh, and, and it's, it's something that I read about. I was a small child at the time, so uh, for you to help us understand that history is a, is a tremendous uh, and, and valuable gift. So thank you. Well, <coughs> glad to be here, Dan. One of the things I find remarkable about your story is, is the beginning. So you were born in Kashmir, went to Aberdeen High School, and you're in law school at age 23 and you decide to run for the state legislature. What was, what was going on in your mind as a 23-year-old saying, I have to go and, and be elected to office? Well, I hate to tell you this story. I've only told it a couple of times before. <clears throat> but uh, my, uh, my political career, as it was, started out with a flip of a coin. Uh, I was president of the Young Democrats on campus. My vice president and I wanted to build the membership. We only had about 25 members. We wanted a couple, 300 people, and then we were going to go to work in the campaign. So we went over to the local uh, 30 then 32nd district uh, uh, campaign office for the Democrats, and they kind of dismissed us, a bunch of kids, you know. Well, you were, you were yeah. just a kid. <laughs> well, we were. I was 22. And we went uh, then back, and we the next morning said, what are we going to do? Because we've been kind of shut out. And uh, we decided we would, one of us would run. So we flipped a coin, and I lost. <laughs> we were both in law school. And so I had to, had to run. The loser had yeah, to win. The loser had to run. And so we, uh, we mobilized kids. We had 300 kids out doorbelling by the time it was done. Didn't spend very much money. In fact, we didn't have any. And the most surprised guy in the whole uh, Washington State Legislature was me. The second most surprised guy was the person I defeated, a guy named Hartney Oaks, who'd been there for 30 years. Wow. Uh, we went out and debated. He'd call me boy. You know, what's the, what does the boy think about this? Whoa. So anyway, that was the start, the genesis of my campaign. And how were you treated in Olympia as, as a boy legislator? They put me in the very back seat, right in front <laughs> of the water fountain. <laughs> The speaker couldn't even see me back there. What did you learn about politics at that young age? I, I learned that you really needed to be involved, number one. You had to get involved instead of, like many people, particularly younger people today, will just complain. Well, you, you, you're okay to complain, but you got to get involved and do something about what you're complaining about. And uh, I learned at that time that hard work, hard work really wins uh, the, the race at the end, and that's that's why I stayed involved. And then I moved over to the state senate, and then ran for mayor. And what was the thought that went through your head when? Because the, the the politics in Olympia is very different from being an administrator of a major city. What what made you think that that was the next logical transition for you? Uh, well, I, I didn't want to grow old in the in the senate. You know, I wanted to get on and, and do other things. And the, the seat that really appealed to me was the uh, job of mayor because city was, Seattle was a very sleepy town at that time. In, in 1969, not too much was happening. We had just emerged from the World's Fair where the, where the yes. world learned where Seattle yes. was on yes. the map. But then yes. after that, was there kind of a hangover from the World's Fair with not, not a lot of civic innovation going on? Uh, there really was. Uh, the only thing of any real moment that was happening was we had a series of bond issues. We called them forward trust. Um, and uh, th those came on uh, and were basically voted for, with two exceptions. One and of the exceptions that we lost was the mass transfer one. Yeah, well, that hurt too. I, the Sunday before the second election, uh, I was out speaking to uh, six different churches, saying, "Don't forget to vote on Tuesday." Uh, and unfortunately, we really lost out. But but I don't I don't really fault the public, the voters, because. We had got, just gone through, we were in the middle of a major recession. 
and uh, and uh, they were scared. When you read the history books about that mass transit vote, though, you see that Senator Magnuson, who was a very powerful figure for the state, was holding on to nine hundred million dollars earmarked for Seattle's new mass transit. It went to Atlanta. And it went to Atlanta. <laughs> so there are our losses. It was a heartbreaker. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the things that did pass, they were key to the infrastructure of our region. Yes. Like, give us some examples. Well, one of my favorites is the aquarium. Uh, I, I enjoy the aquarium still at this point. At the time that we took those funds and passed, uh, the, you know, the, the major actually passed, we took those funds and we built an aquarium that was acclaimed across the, the world. In fact, the, the people, I, there were local people, Kramer, Chin, and Mayo, uh, I knew them well because they'd done other work and I knew them before I even was mayor. They took the job they did there and they became the experts in Aquaria mm -hmm. across the country, or across the world. I remember as a child growing up here going to see the killer whale that we had oh, and, yeah. and it, was, it was a huge deal yeah, for, yeah, for those yeah. of us growing up. The other huge deal is I remember that uh, the, we, they passed a major sewer bond to clean mm -hmm. up, mm -hmm. to do wastewater <clears throat> treatment. We hadn't done it very well. As a consequence, uh, Lake Washington was unswimmable. It had signs that say <clears throat> yep. the kids don't swim. Uh, that's the, the measure that uh, permitted us to form Metro as a Metro organization. Uh, I have a vested interest in this, by the way, because my, my wife was the director of Metro. <laughs> Carolyn Purnell, long time yeah, yes, she uh, was. county employee. Um, and uh, uh, what we did there is we melded together the bus system and the, the cleanup of Lake, Lake uh, Washington. We melded those together in this unique entity that we were just talking about, Metro. And uh, we were, compare us, for example, to uh, Van Vancouria, Van Vancouver. Victoria, Victoria. Was, they still haven't done that. Vancouver it's, finally did. Uh -huh. Victoria still has not. And that's where we would still be uh, yeah. had we not gone ahead and done this, this forward thrust proposal that we talked about. So some of the civic uh, leaders at the time, Jim Ellis, father of that, you were involved. Did, did that teach you that the, there's a power of government for good, for the general good and the health and welfare of people, that government could be, could be uh, a force for good? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, government is, by definition, a force for good. When it's not, it's not really government. It's, it's, it's anarchy. Uh, it's very important to recognize that what we, if we mobilize our government, mobilize people working in that government, that we can do all kinds of good. So 1969, you're elected 34 years old as the mayor of this backwater city that's soon to be a major city. Uh, what, what was on your agenda at, at when you ran and what happened when you took the office? Well, when I uh, originally ran, there were a lot of things that were on my agenda. For example, we had a, we can talk about this a little later if you want, but we had a major issue in terms of, of uh, our workforce. We had one black cop, no female cops. Uh, there, there so were, there diversity of, was a word we yeah, didn't yeah, use there, back. There were, no, no. Uh, there were two of them who worked in the, two female cops who worked in uh, juvenile. That was it. No, uh, there's one black fireman, no female fireman, and go over at City Light, and there were absolutely no managers of either color or gender. And so, as and you. And so, that was one of my, one of the things I wanted to do, and fortunately, uh, we accomplished a great deal of that. But it wasn't easy, it was there? Was a lot of resistance from City Hall and from those people who had those jobs. Uh, I'm the only person since the uh, 1920s that had to had to undergo a a uh, recall election. So the recall was, and it was brought by disgruntled city employees. Firemen, firemen union, and uh, disgruntled employees in the, in in the City Light. Uh, they brought it, and uh, I was worried. Oh, any time. Because because we were kind of shaking the tree uh, in in terms of. What, what had happened before, and but the the people got the message. That I didn't start this motto, nor did anyone in the city government. But it started in, in the Seattle Times. Don't let the animals run the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> and and toward the end of to finish on this topic, toward the end of your uh, second term, uh, I read that you established the first Gay Pride Week that we'd ever had here in Seattle. Uh, uh, that's true, and I, it sounds uh, very archaic or. Uh, kind of quaint at but, this point in time, 
but it brought the house down. 1977, uh, we weren't, never, not everybody was ready for LGBTQ to discuss. They really, really weren't. Uh, uh, my, my poor little secretary who had to answer the, the, all of the, the, the telephone calls, she came back crying. She said, you will not believe what they're calling you, ma Mayor. <laughs> I said, I believe it. But it, it had to be done, and we had to break that ground, and we had to begin to treat people, not on the basis of... Uh, uh, who they were or whatever, but uh, just, just just like people. We had to treat them uh, fairly. Dignity for all was still a radical notion. It was a radical notion. The other thing that was radical at the time, you've got Richard Nixon in the White House, you've got a very unpopular Vietnam War, and those protests were all over America, and there were riots in the streets in America, but what was the, what was the scene in Seattle at that time? <laughs> like everywhere else. It, it was maybe uh, more controlled here because we tried to treat it as a, an event that we were happy to hear them, happy to see them, just don't cross the line on violence. And uh, to an extent on the Vietnam protest, that really happened. Uh, our students at the university, for example, uh, I, I shut down the freeway. They came, left the campus, 10,000 people strong. Down I-5? Down I-5 to see me. <laughs> Uh, had you invited them to come see I you? I did not invite them. <laughs> but that was just, they had to go but somewhere, they so had why to go not? somewhere, and uh -huh. so they, they chose City Hall, and they chose the mayor, because I was the most visible person. But we also, were you sympathetic, you're a young guy back then, were you sympathetic to the, the protests against the war? Kind of, yeah, kind of. But as a person who's active politically, you just tried not to touch that one. You tried, to, that's kind of almost a third rail, because these people felt very strongly that we should support the troops, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. These people felt it was an unjust war. And you were just trying to run a city? Trying to run a city. Yeah. So what happened when all these 10,000 people came down I-5 and got off on, I assume, the, the James Street exit and found uh, City Hall? And were you at work then? Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, they, they, at that time in the old uh, building, there was a, a kind of a balcony there. And my staff gave me a bullhorn. They pushed me out on this balcony. Here all the 10,000 people. They had not prepared a speech for you at this time? Uh, no, there's not, not a speech time. Okay. I was just supposed to say nice things and, you know, welcome and uh, et cetera. I didn't get a word out because here were 10,000 people all shouting at the top of their voice, B, S, B, and, and it was the full. Without the acronym. Uh, yeah. So, and, um, and, and so I clambered back. That was and, the end uh, of your speech. Went back to work in my office. <laughs> But the, op, the, the other alternative you had was to meet that with force and to... We didn't. And, and, to, and, and what, was there some pe people in the police department who wanted you to, to push back? Yeah, very definitely. We had a tax squad and they felt that we should uh, deal with this uh, and, and not just let people get away with it. There were other things happening that were, uh, that should not have happened, that were... They were violent they, protests. They were violent protests and we took those on. Mm -hmm. But the but era it, of nonviolent dis civil disobedience, I mean, that, that, that Dr. King had, had really preached about. And of course, Dr. King had just been assassinated yes. the year before. So was that on your mind when you were trying to think, what do we do with, when the people want to speak? But we, by and large, um, we, by and large, uh, uh, did not get that kind of a reaction. We had just several. But uh, the principal problems we had here in Seattle were, were several. Bombings. Uh, and uh, uh, that, that, that was basically conducted by two groups of people. One was a group of, uh, they called themselves the black contractors. And they were pretty violent because they were looking, their, their stated goal was to get more jobs for themselves, the black contractors. And then we had some, a group called the weathermen. Mm -hmm. Most people have forgotten them. They were really violent. They bombed the ROTC building twice here locally. And they then they put a big bomb in the library at the University of Washington. Killed two people in the stacks. I don't think many people remember that. No, no, they don't. But it happened. <laughs> so the, all that's going on, and then I understand the week after you take office, a 34-year-old mayor, that the Boeing company has an announcement. Well, it wasn't exactly the week. It was it was a couple of weeks later or actually over a month, they, I, got, I was sitting in my office. I had all these grand plans. You know, I was going to do this, do that. And uh, on a Friday afternoon, I received a call from a man named T. Wilson. T. 
T.A. Wilson, chairman of yep. Boeing Corp. And he said, just call me T. I had never met him. <laughs> he, uh, I, just, I was brand new in the job, and we, our paths had not crossed before. And he said, uh, Mayor, he spoke, he was an engineer who had a crew cut in 19, 1970, <laughs> which gives you an, you know, a good impression of him. Uh, he said, Mayor, he said, the Boeing Company is going to make a very important announcement on Monday morning. It's going to affect the city substantially. Uh, he said, I will send the team down to brief you on Monday morning at 8 o'clock, if that's acceptable to you. I said, sure. But uh, Mr. Wilson, no, he said, call me T. He said, uh, can you give me some kind of a hint? He says, no. He says, I cannot. It's illegal for me to give you any kind of a hint until it's publicly disclosed what we're going to be announcing. Well, you talk about all these riots, all these, these protests, all the rest of that, all paled uh, <clears throat> in comparison to what he said. And that was that the Boeing Company was going to, number one, do away with their SST program. Number two, they're going to have these huge numbers of layoffs. Um, they went from 103,000 employees down to 39,000. Wow. 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 It was amazing. Um, and they were all based here in Seattle. Well, and we didn't have any Microsoft then. Nothing and we didn't have any Amazon. We didn't have any Starbucks. This was um, a Boeing Company town. It was a Boeing Company town, pure and simple. And so, you know, people at that point in time, they were all being laid off. And uh, you, could, uh, you, you could, you know, drive a car down the freeway and they, you wouldn't see another one. I did that from home to my office one time. Uh, but the, the, these, these folks were just out of a job and they were all fairly... Uh, specialized. So they would simply, time after time after time, they'd put their, their home keys in, a, in an envelope and mail it to the bank and leave town, put everything in their car and wow. leave town. They disappeared. And there, a, a billboard sprung uh, up. The famous billboard. Tell us what that is. Uh, well, everybody knows that, even some people who weren't there, but it was, will the last person to leave Seattle please turn out the lights? It was that bad. It was that bad. So you're facing that as a, as a brand new mayor. What, what, what were your reactions? I practically lived in Maggie's office. Senator Magnuson was the chair of the Appropriations Committee in the United States Senate, arguably the most uh, influential, powerful person in the government. And he wasn't afraid to use it. And uh, so I spent my time. They actually put up a little desk. <laughs> back in the corner of, he had this giant office. Uh, Norm Dix was his administrative assistant at that time, and so we, we I almost lived there. And the, and the, the, the federal government was able to bring yes. us Maggie, enough work. Maggie and, brought home the bacon, yeah. just really that simple. Those were the good old days. Right? Those were the good old days. So Seattle managed to exist even despite losing these 60,000 plus Boeing jobs. What, what, were, you, what were you doing um, to try to, to make sure that that could stay? Because sometimes those government contracts come and then they leave town, too. How, how, how does we sustain that here? Uh, well, first of all, the primary goal was just to survive. Seattle had to survive. We, we cut back on almost everything. It was uh, uh, a time when it was not fun to be mayor <laughs> because there's all the things, first of all, that you had kind of promised or said you were going to try to do were not available. They, they couldn't be done because there were no funds to do it. So we had to center on, we, we had to survive first of all, which we did. We had to center on those things which didn't cost money. For example, what I was mentioning a moment ago about trying to make the city workforce look like the city. Mm -hmm. And we were able to do some of those things. They were contentious. Uh, the, the recall election I mean, is, a, is a good example good. of yes. that. They were around. contentious and we had to use something uh, to get around the civil service rules, we called it selective certification, fancy word for picking people uh, for other reasons than simply how they, how they uh, fared on a test. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were quite successful on that. And if you look at the city workforce now, it, it, it's, it's a good one. It's one that I'm proud of. It's a good legacy for, that, for you. Uh, and uh, also preservation of some of our historic neighborhoods was a priority, I understand. Yeah, it was a real priority for me. When I, uh, I've always felt very strongly that if you forget your history, you're going to repeat it. 
and and that's that's a, a shown fact. One of the very I had all of my my uh, then um, uh, heads of of the departments come in and tell me when I first took office, spend a, maybe most of a day with me. What are you doing in your department? What's happening? What's going on? What are your goals? And uh, the head of the Department of Community Development came in carrying one of these uh, big uh, mobiles, you know, with, with all kinds of stuff on it. And I said, what is that? He had several of those that said, what is this one? It was Pioneer Square, which was then the adopted city uh, plan, were two giant glass towers Ooh. and parking for four, four blocks all the way around it. And that was the that was that your was, agency director said let's level Pioneer Square and build some skyscrapers. Well, yeah, that was not just I don't just blame him. He was he was fulfilling what the city council and the then mayor had told him to do. And I said, you know, Santiana left us a very good legacy, and that is, if you forget the history, then you're going to repeat it, in more fancy words than that. And I said, we're not going to do that. So we saved Pioneer Square. Uh, by one vote in the council. Wow. And uh, and now it's gone through several iterations, but it is back now, really, uh, when you have an enormous uh, influx of very quality tenants. And have Warehouser headquarters Warehouser right itself, there yeah. in, in the middle of Occidental Square. Yeah. And, and yeah. then the stadium's not far away, and it has become a place where tourists are drawn to. Yeah, and, and we had battles continuing in this area. For example, uh, I'm not going to mention his name, but a very prominent uh, person in, who owned a television station owned a building on First Avenue. I had indicated, unfortunately, publicly, that we were going to designate that building and save it. Uh, it was there Friday when I came down First Avenue on, on Monday morning. <laughs> It was gone. And already <laughs> torn it down. Wow. We missed that one. So, and we've got you know the the, the public market, uh, place market, uh, mm -hmm. another huge. That's yeah. what Seattle's known for now. Yeah. To think yeah. that it was yeah. also on the chopping block. It's world. in every promotional item we see now. So, some vision, a future vision, which includes honoring the past, is something that you brought to office. Yeah. So. Talk a little bit about what you've done since you left. It's been a very long time, and you, and you, you kind of disappeared from politics into, into the private sector. What was your career after you left? The, the well, I spent, I'm a lawyer, and I spent uh, all the time in the legislature uh, still practicing law. In those days, the legislative sessions were much shorter. And then uh, uh, I became mayor, and all of this period of time as mayor, the, the, the salaries weren't like they are now, and so I, I was pretty poor. <laughs> and so I decided after eight years as mayor, that it was time for me, I had kids getting ready to go to college, you know, those kinds of expenditures, which you're aware of. <laughs> uh, they, uh, I, I decided I was, it was time for me to go out and earn a living and make some money. And that's, I was criticized for saying it that way, but it's really what I had to do. Uh, since then, I have had uh, a, a very successful career in real estate. Uh, my legal background has helped that significantly. I've developed a number of buildings around the, the country. The building in, uh, in El Paso, Texas, uh, four big, four major buildings for the Boeing Company was one of them, and, and others in Cincinnati and, and Cleveland and elsewhere, and, and, and several in California. And you've traveled the world. I have, I have. I've, uh, I, I put off the traveling until I, I'd gotten a, a bit of a, a stake going, but uh, we have traveled the world. In fact, just two, three weeks ago, uh, I was in Iran, wow. which uh, everybody say, why did you go to Iran? Why did you go to Iran? <laughs> well, uh, I was invited 40 years ago by Scoop Jackson, one of our United States senators. That was when the Shah was there. Mm -hmm. I accepted that invitation from Scoop, was ready to go, this is 1979, mm -hmm. and uh, had tickets, everything, and then all of a sudden the Shah was overthrown, and we all remember the, you know, the revolution, the hostages. and there were hostages and, the, and all the rest of it. So it's been on my bucket list that long, Don. Still, you were invited, so you yeah, had to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what do, you, what do you gather, what, what do you gain when you see 
the great cities of the world and you come back to Seattle, are there, are there things that you think that we still need to do to become an, uh, one of the great cities of the world? Uh, I think we are very close to, I, I would consider us to be a great city at this point in time, or we're smaller than, than some of them, but uh, <clears throat> I, think, I think you also, you learn uh, not necessarily the greatness aspect of it, but you learn what other people are doing. And I think that is very important. Uh, <clears throat> I, I established, when I was mayor, the first sister city relationship with a Soviet city. In Uzbekistan? In, in Uzbekistan. That was Tashkent. Uh, <clears throat> and that's a story in and of itself, <laughs> because the State Department refused to accept that. They said, no, you can't do that. We're in, in, this, in this high state of alert with... Cold war with the it, Soviets. It was very how, cold. How can you very, thaw the Cold War by yourself? It was very cold. And uh, so uh, they refused to certify it. And, and we were the first one. And I happened to mention that to Maggie. And he said, let me take care of this. He did. He called in the Secretary of State. And, you know, he has control of the Secretary of State's budget. And he said, what's this all about? And the Secretary of State said, well, it would be a very bad precedent to sit, you know, to have a, a To sit, extend a, the hand of to, friendship yeah, to, to, to... To another so. city in the Soviet Union. And Maggie was kind of liberal on those kind of things anyway. And the next thing I knew was two, two days later, I had a message from the State Department that they had approved it and that we should proceed as quickly as possible. <laughs> Mind you now, the Soviets had already approved it on their side. Mm -hmm. It so, would, have been, would have looked bad for us to say no thank you yeah, to that yeah. it's so, handshake. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the bottom line on that was that uh, that's the kind of relationship that we got, we, we received a lot from that because we knew better when they came over here, they were the first delegation to ever be permitted to come here. When they came over here we could visit with them on an informal basis and see and how they fought and, and we were better off. You know, look back at, at the career you've been discussing with the protests, with Boeing layoffs, with uh, you know, all the, the, the struggles to make City Hall look like the people that they serve. Um, it seems like the, the challenges that face the mayor today may not be so great, even though, uh, you know, if you look back at, at your history. Well, the job's difficult because uh, there are many, many conflicting desires and many conflicting points of view demands. What, what uh, advice do you give Ed Murray, or has he asked you? Oh, yeah, well, yeah, we talk. We're, we're, we're close. I, I give him no public advice because the job's difficult enough without ghosts of mayor's past coming up and criticizing or whatever. Very good. Uh, uh, but uh, I, I advise him just do the best he can. I mean, uh, try to follow what he considers to be his moral star, and uh, and he'll be okay. But he'll not have a lot. Well, for example, on on when I declared Gay Pride Week, those people were through with me forever. <laughs> but you didn't care because you were following your moral star. Yeah, and and I think he's doing that. Uh, I disagree with him, but I'm not going to. And then talk about it here. Right. I disagree with him on some of the things he's doing, but uh, I respect the, the fact that he he is totally committed and is doing the, the things that he feels is are, are correct and right. And uh, so I try to keep quiet publicly. That's all you can ask of any yeah. Yeah. public servant yeah. is to do what they think is right. Yeah. Well, Mayor Wes Ullman, thank you so much for being a guest here on Prosecutors Partnered and, and for that stroll down the, the memory lane. Uh, I, have to, I have one more thing i got to say. Now, when I was a child, uh, my parents took me to see a movie. It was called Harry in Your Pocket. Do you oh, remember yeah. that movie? Uh, I was in that movie. That, and I, was sitting, <laughs> I was picking people's pockets. <laughs> I was next to my dad, and he said, that's the mayor. <laughs> it was a, a movie starring James Colburn. It was filmed yeah. in Seattle, yeah. and it was about, about pickpockets. Yeah. How did you end up in that movie? Uh, they called me, uh, or one of the members of my staff said, you know, uh, we've gotten this call, and we, they'd like to have you there, but it's in Seattle. We've not filmed very much in Seattle ever, and we'd like to have, see if the mayor would take a very small part in that. And I said, well, why not? You know, maybe we'll get them back again filming more and spending more money here in our city. Uh, it was fun. It was fun to do. Uh, let me say one thing before we break. I really appreciate the job that you're doing, and I, want, I, hope, I hope they don't cut this. Thank you. <laughs> uh, when I took office, we had a lot of police issues 
the assistant police chief was, was under indictment. About nine, maybe 10 cops themselves were under indictment. We had a very politicized criminal justice system in Seattle. I'm leading up to a point here. Okay. Uh, our uh, uh, prosecuting attorney was also at, at a point while he was still prosecuting attorney, was the chairman of the Republican Party. It was politicized. The whole operation was politicized. And anybody who will objectively look back will agree with that. Now, you've got some extra ammunition this last election right. in creating a, a, your job as a nonpartisan job. I think that's just tremendous. Now, you've never been involved in the politicization that happened back then. We've steadily moved away from that. And the fact that in, in, in King County, which is the most democratic county in the state, that you can still get elected as a Republican is a tribute to you. Well, thank you very much. And, and it, it, that corruption did happen. It was happening right here in the King County Courthouse. Yes. And I think it was because they lost sight of doing justice and instead it was, they created a political machine. And That's correct. as you have said, those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. So yeah. we're not going to do that. Here. We're not going to do that. Not with you here. Thank you. <laughs> My guest today on Prosecutor's Partner has been Wes Ullman, former mayor of the city of Seattle, a moral star and a movie star. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Tune in again next time on Prosecutor's Partners. We'll introduce you to some of the men and women making a difference in justice in our county. Thank you very much. I'm Dan Satterberg. We'll see you again.